So we're excited to welcome you to this webinar about the International Financial Reporting for Non-for-Profit um, project and how it's relevant for the stakeholders in Nigeria. Most of the audience today and basically Nigerians, but um, I know a lot of people who have registered from all over the world. Every, we are all welcome. Um, I know that the registration, so you're all welcome to this webinar today. Um, Nigeria has a strong uh, MPO presence um, across the country, both internationally and uh, both international MPOs and the national. And these MPOs are expected to submit um, the audited financial reports every year. Currently, Nigeria does not have a specific standard guiding the annual report preparation. We rely mainly on donors' guidelines and the IFRS. For non for profit organization. This is, a reason, this is the reason why we are here this morning. Uh, in this meeting, we will introduce the um, International Financial Reporting Project and hear from experts, experts here in Nigeria before opening up for some smaller groups. We're going to have a smaller group in the course of this meeting. And also, we then look at how we, as stakeholders in Nigeria and beyond, can get involved and play our part in shaping the future of financial reporting in the non-for-profit organizations. And our needs um, and perspectives, so that our needs and perspectives are, are reflected in the final uh, production of this, um, of this um, guidance. So it is great to see everyone here and um, take a minute to introduce yourself. If you're just joining, um, you can introduce yourself in the chat. Um, just tell us your role, your organization in the chat, in the chat box. Um, we'll particularly, we would like to particularly recognize the presence of um, everyone. And we have um, representatives from ICANN, that's Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. And we have um, the National Working Group. We'll talk more about that in the course of, um, in the course of this uh, meeting. And we have representative stakeholders such as um, also from a Financial Reporting Council and the academicians, you know, we, we are all welcome. Everyone is welcome here. At this point, I would like to invite the project director, uh, Samantha, who's okay, to give us a um, few words before we continue. Thank you so much, uh, Tamita Pei. So I'm really delighted to uh, welcome you here for this meeting. Uh, my name is Samantha Musoke, and I'm the IFR for MPO project director for Humentum. I'm a chartered accountant from the UK, uh, but I've been living in Uganda for the last 21 years, uh, working in and for the nonprofit sector. So as we uh, develop the world's first international reporting, financial reporting guidance, tailored specifically for the needs of the nonprofit sector, it's so vital that we draw on the expertise and experience and perspectives from all stakeholders all over the world. So we NPOs themselves, donors, regulators, auditors, and wider society. And it's only in this way that we can create something that will really be useful and meaningful and relevant that can go on to be adopted by many jurisdictions and become a global standard for the sector. So I'd really love to thank uh, Timitope and Akintoye, our eminent speakers for today, uh, for their invaluable efforts uh, to help us engage with all of you as uh, sector stakeholders in Nigeria. And I also want to thank all of you for coming. I'm really yeah. looking forward to an inspiring and fruitful meeting and excited to hear all your comments and contributions. So thank you so much. Back to you, Tumitope. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. Um, let us now invite Akito Yolufemi to take us through the presentation and tell us more about um, the IFR, in, IFR for non for profit for NPOs. Over to you, Lufemi. You might be muted. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, so thank you so much, Timitope. Um, once again, I would like to welcome all of us. And thank you also for joining us in this, in this event for today. Um, so we are First of all, we'd like to know more about, I'd like to tell you more about um, the IFR for MPOs. 
Um, it's a project, and, and let you know what the project is all about. It's an initiative to develop international applicable financial statement, uh, reporting gui gui guidance specifically for um, MPOs, uh, thereby improving accountability, improving consistency, and improving transparency and trust among the users of the MPO financial statement. Uh, uh, okay, so that, that's basically what's uh, the project is all about. Uh, you must have heard of um, um, problem three. Uh, for the MPO, it's, it's, it's more like a forest. Um, uh, the problem is, is so, so enormous. There are different problems that are experienced by different stakeholders and are mostly felt in by countries, especially those countries that don't have um, guidance for their MPOs. They feel a lot of this um, problems. Uh, so examples that are shown in the slide uh, that, that you are seeing represent a fraction of the problems and consequences. Um, and many are interlinked. So of, of course, some MPOs are not donor funded. And for that reason, uh, they may not experience all the problems that have been highlighted. Uh, but generally, funders say that most of, what, most of the audited accounts that they have um, are not particularly useful to them, um, resulting in high cost of due diligence, uh, which impacts grantees as well. Uh, so with many potential grantees being excluded or ineligible for certain types of, of funding, okay? Uh, for MPOs, a reliance on project-based funding, uh, sorry, I think my lighting, let me just take a minute, I'll get back to you. Uh, While we are waiting for Olufemi, we can still go ahead and um, for those joining us afresh, um, you can go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, we want to know your name, your organization, your role um, that you're occupying. And um, I'm, we also have um, Pamela Moro Elise. She's a chairperson of the steering group. I'm sure she's, um, she has joined us. Maybe she's join, going to join us later. She's from Jamaica. Um, She's the global non-for-profit accounting project for this um, um, international financial reporting for non-for-profit. So welcome, Pamela, if you're there from Jamaica. Thank you. Over to Olufemi. OK, so thank you, Jimmy Tope. And, and sorry for that. Um, the lighting just went off, but we are back. OK, so for, as I was saying, for MPOs, um, a reliance on project-based funding rather than unrestricted income it's a common problem across board, so which makes it difficult to build reserves and causes multiple and duplicative um, reporting. I think we have lost Olifemi. Yeah. Oh, he's back. We lost you for a moment there. We lost you for Okay, so can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so sorry, about that. I think the network had issues. Um, so, so as I was saying, I said for MPOs, a reliance on project-based funding rather than unrestricted um, income is a common problem across um, um, the, 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 the NGO world, uh, which makes it difficult to build reserve and causes multiple and duplicative reporting and audits. Uh, so for auditors, the focus on project level audits can make it hard to identify double funding fraud, uh, which is a major concern for, for donors. So moreover, uh, they often have to issue their opinion in reference to uh, specific um, guidelines that are for, prof for, the, for the profit sectors in mind. Uh, and in, in those in cases where they don't have um, specific guidelines for the profit sector relating to the non-profit sector, uh, in case where the standards are silent uh, or seems inappropriate for MPOs, uh, they normally do it according to uh, their belief, which is inconsistency with, at least the inconsistency among um, the MPOs. So, so that, that's a challenge on its own. Uh, for regulators and civil society more broadly, 
the lack of information and transparency can result in lack of trust, uh, which could not be beneficial to, to building domestic philanthropies and creating an environment where tax exemption for non-profit is, is the norm, okay? Um, so these problems have very many root causes, uh, but the major com the common denominator um, is that there's lack of a standard that's internationally acceptable for financial reporting for the MPO's um, organization generally. So, so that, that's the common denominators among all the problems. Okay, so what uh, will MP, what, what will IFR for MPO deliver? Uh, we are looking at one, the solution that the MPO will provide is international applicable guidance for MPOs uh, to prepare their annual general proposed financial reports. Okay, um, it will be, it would be up to a particular country to decide whether to adopt it or to align um, to the guidance and whether certain MPOs within their jurisdiction should uh, be required to or allowed to follow it. Uh, funders may also recognize it as best practice and encourage its use where entities are allowed to adopt it as well. Okay. Yeah, so the future outcomes and benefits are wide, uh, are wide ranging. Uh, for MPOs applying the guidance, it may seem uh, they will be a better, they will be better able to demonstrate their capacity and attract funding, um, as well as support the provision of decisions, useful information for governance and, and management. Uh, for funders, it contributes to better and more efficient due diligence, which is a win for the MPOs too. And having clear guidance simplifies and improves the value of, of audit, audit assurance. Uh, so one of the other really important outcomes from this project uh, is to separate from the guide, guideline, guidance itself is the creation of a global community of stakeholders uh, who are able to engage and collaborate to solve sector-wide issues. And this has never been in existence before. So just coming on board now. So ultimately, uh, we believe that the guidance will contribute to a more resilient and accountable sector that is better able to attract, generate, and utilize funds to achieve positive social good. Okay, uh, so we financial reports um, are, are we looking at? So it, it is important for us to to specify the reports that um, this project is after. So we, as, as we are aware, um, MPOs produce different types of, of financial reports. Uh, so it is important to clear uh, which reports this is, is focused on. Uh, the MPR, the IFR for MPO project is focused on general purpose financial statements and accompanying narrative reports. Uh, these are also known as annual audit accounts and for the entity as, as a whole, rather than a specific um, project. Okay, so in, in the sector, uh, we are used with specific um, project reports, but this is for um, the general annual annual reports. And they are designed to be useful for a range of readers or users rather than being produced to meet the need of one's connected because they generated from this same accounting system of, of transactions, okay? Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank God. We lost a little bit, but we can hear you now. Which is clear. Okay, so what are the project objectives then? Okay, so um,
dear, the connection is really breaking up. Object to you. Olufemi, yeah. you keep going in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, yeah, sorry, I think, I think the network is not very stable. Yeah. Uh, well, can you hear me now? It's on. If it, if it goes off again, I'll, I'll step in and do this section. Um, just so we get a, a, a continuity. But if it keeps going, it'd be great. So do you want to just do from um, just the end of the previous slide about the other initiatives? We didn't hear that. Yeah, we can't hear him. Sorry. So, um, Timitope, do you think it's okay if I take on just to step in it as a backup? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Samantha, I think at this point, um, you may have to take over. Because um, Akinto's <laughs> network is um, is very erratic. Okay, sorry. Okay, so let me pick up where he's ably left us. So just in terms of focusing on the financial reports, he mentioned that we're focusing on the general purpose financial reports. But of course, if you're an NPO, these different reports are really connected because they're generated from one accounting system. And of course, they derive from the same source transactions. So there are other initiatives that are in progress, which are designed to harmonize donor project reporting formats, which is really complementary and vitally important. But just to be clear and manage expectations, those donor reporting formats are not the primary focus for the IFR for MPO project itself. So just wanted to clarify that because it's a common area where people, because so much of our effort is focused on donor reporting. So in terms of the objectives uh, for the project, there are three stated objectives for the guidance that will be produced by the IFR for MPO project. The first is to improve the quality transparency and credibility of the financial reports of NPOs. The second objective is to support the provision of NPO financial information that is useful for decision making and accountability, balancing the needs of both preparers and users. And then the third objective is to address specific NPO issues uh, which we hope will promote increased comparability of NPO financial reports. So I think we're now going to take a quick poll. We just laid out some of the problems and the, the big picture of the solution. So I'd love to launch a quick poll. I'm hoping it will come up here uh, so that you can tell us your feedback. So it's a very quick one. Hopefully you can see that on your screen. Yeah. Can you see that? Yes, I can see people answering already. That's fantastic. Give another 30 seconds for you all to have a vote. It's a very easy poll. Do these issues, the problems and the objectives of the project, what we're trying to achieve, does this resonate with you? Greatly, yes, but I have some questions somehow or not really. Great, I'll end the poll there. We've, I think 65% of people have answered. So we'll uh, close it there and you can see the results. So I think you can see there, 79% of you saying, yes, greatly. We hear, we feel these issues every day. These are things that are problems we experience and the objectives are things that we really need. Some of you have, still have some questions and um, some of you to some extent, some of these resonate and some of these maybe less so, uh, which is fine. Uh, but it's great that um, for many of you, these are issues that are resonating. So. Some of you said you have some key questions. So what I would like to do is just answer um, some key questions that we are often asked, some questions that often come up. So we're gonna be looking at who's delivering this project, how is it going to be developed, and which size of MPOs is it for? We'll answer those first. Uh, and of course, you'll have a chance to answer other ask other questions later. 
So in terms of who's delivering it, uh, it's being implemented by two organizations in partnership, that is Humentum and SIPFA. So Humentum is the leading global nonprofit working with humanitarian and development organizations to improve how they operate and make the community as a whole more equitable, accountable, and resilient. So we convene NPO professionals, we inspire sector-wide change. Um, in Nigeria, you might have heard of Mango or Inside NGO, used to run training events for nonprofits in Nigeria, and they've merged to form Humentum in 2017. So if you've come across Mango or Inside NGO, it's the same organization. Then the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy is a UK-based professional accountancy organization. Uh, and it has roles in standard setting for local government and charities in the UK. But SIPFA also plays an important role as an international convener on public sector accounting issues. So not the for-profit, not non-profit, but public sector government. Now between them, uh, Humentum and SIPFA, uh, we're well connected to a range of stakeholders within the sector that's really critical to this project. And both Humentum and SIPFA ourselves, we are both nonprofit organizations. So this initiative is really a sort of by the sector for the sector. Now seed funding uh, for the project to launch was provided by the Open Society Foundations and the Ford Foundation. And then the Oak Foundation and Wellspring Foundations have also provided funding. Uh, and we are always fundraising to make sure we can uh, raise enough money to finish the project. But no funder has influence over the outcomes of the contents of the guidance. They're really funding the process, which is a consultatory and participatory one. Now, we do have a technical advisory group. Um, the project team itself is actually really small, like two from SIPFA and two from Humentum. But we draw on this experience from advisory groups who offer their perspectives and experience on a voluntary basis. Now, the technical advisory group that you can see here comprises national accounting standard setters from five continents. It's mostly countries that have their own national standard for nonprofits because they've got experience in doing it. They've you know, struggled with some of the challenges, but there are also representation from all continents, uh, especially Africa, you can see there, um, that don't, many countries don't have their own national standard. Um, we also have an official observer from the International Accounting Standards Board. Now, the IASB are not drafting this guidance. It's not within their mandate, but they have formally recognized that it's necessary and they are watching closely and supporting us in this way by being an observer on the technical advisory group. Now, the practitioner advisory group uh, includes preparers, users, auditors, and academics, all of whom specializing in the nonprofit sector. So we're proactively seeking to build and maintain diversity in these groups. Information about each member and details of all the meetings can be found on the project website. So the process is really fully transparent, but it, with smaller groups that can be practical for getting feedback in a timely basis, timely manner. We also have a donor reference group. So during the project's outreach sessions in 2020, it was highlighted that for many MPOs, most of the financial reporting effort and accounting system set up is driven largely by the requirements of their donors. When you think financial reporting, you think donors. Um, so we were told time and time again, look, if the donors don't recognize this guidance as best practice for general purpose reporting, it really won't be helpful for us. If they won't use it and rely on it, then it won't reduce our reporting burden, it will increase it. So we've uh, developed this donor reference group and established it specifically to seek their input um, and hopefully secure their support and ultimate endorsement so that they can endorse the guidance when it's written um, and that can increase its credibility and adoption and usefulness. Now, the meetings of the donor reference group aren't published, 
but we do share uh, reports of key outputs as appropriate and the members are listed on the website. So most recently we were published a report on how donors make use of the general purpose financial reports of grantees and potential grantees and how they could be made more useful. Now, um, in terms of uh, beyond those advisory groups, the advisory groups are really a sort of micro version of the much broader global stakeholder group that we're looking to engage with. So we are engaging with stakeholders all over the world. I think you can see there where well, it says 157. I think we're now at 160 countries. Um, and as Nigerians or visitors to the Nigeria meeting, you are also very, very warmly welcome. We want you to be part of this initiative. Now, the other key question, so that's just like who's who's in, who's developing this? Uh, so the project team, the advisory groups, and ultimately all the stakeholders who we hope will give input. How's the guidance actually being developed? What's the, um, the process? So let's get an overview of the how and the when. So this guidance is being developed using a three-phase process, which is equivalent to all other accounting standard setting processes. Phase one, which is now complete, was the consultation phase. The key output was a 280 page consultation paper, which presented questions for structured input from stakeholders. The second phase is the development phase. It's where we are now. We analyze the feedback from the consultation and use that as an evidence base to develop draft guidance which is then exposed for comment. It's called an exposure draft. It will be shared with the world and we look forward to your comments on it. Then the third phase will take stock of that feedback from the exposure draft and put through changes before launching the final guidance. And that's expected in early 2025. But developing the guidance itself is actually just the beginning because the benefit to the sector will really be felt after it's widely adopted and used. So this is why uh, we have a sort of two aspects to the IFR for MPO project design. One aspect is the technical rigor that's applied to the guidance development process. That's led by SIPFA who have experience in that. And the other aspect is the stakeholder engagement which is led by Humentum of actively reaching out to stakeholders all over the world, regulators, the national professional accountancy organizations like ICANN, thank you for coming, donors and MPOs, so that everyone can participate in this development process and be ready and willing to adopt it, hopefully when it's ready. So what are some of the sort of issues, NPO specific accounting issues? What are the types of issues that we're addressing? Broadly, they can be split into two categories. There's a sort of landscape level issues and specific technical accounting and reporting issues. Now at the landscape level, it's addressing fundamental questions like, who are the users of NPO financial reports? What are their information needs? It's really different from for-profit where it's investors looking at profitability, return on investment and things like that. What is the equivalent for our sector? Who are the users? What are they really looking for? How are the concepts and pervasive principles different to those in the for-profit and the public sectors? Now, in terms of the specific issues, you can see a list on the screen. I won't go through all of them. Each one is worthy of a two hour webinar or more and pages and pages of uh, technical details in the consultation paper. But for example, how to account for non-exchange revenue like income, um, income like grants and donations. When do you recognize a gift in kind? Do you have to recognize it at all? Um, how should we lay out and present the main financial statements? Do we want to have vertical or uh, horizontal balance sheets? Do we want to do fund accounting and track restricted income and expenditure separately? So the big level questions about the shape of the financial statements are under the technical topics there. Now, there are, for each of these issues in the list, there are, um, there, there are videos, there are technical papers and there are webinars and links to join online conversations. So 
each of these topics and you can find them on the website under the heading guidance accounting issues there's a page dedicated to each one of these topics so if one of them is of particular interest to you, you can do a deep dive oh i'm just going to ask you to mute if you're not um presenting super so there's a, you can find out more there if you're interested now what will the guidance actually be called? The guidance is being developed by the IFR for MPO project, uh, but the guidance itself will be called INPAG, International Nonprofit Accounting Guidance. Now, our longer term vision and our hope is that one day it will be issued by a recognized international accounting standard setting body, and then it could be known as INPAS like international nonprofit accounting a standard, and it can sit alongside IFRS and IPSAS. But right now it's in PAG, which is the first step on that longer journey. Now, the other key question that we're often asked is which, which NPOs is the guidance being designed for? It's our final question for this section. So our sector is wonderfully diverse, isn't it? So the users of NPO financial reports, therefore, also have a really wide range of needs. It's really impossible to, to do a one size fits all. So to focus the efforts of the project, we imagined dividing all the world's NPOs into three broad tiers. So tier three uh, are micro NPOs. That the users of their financial reports are likely to have simpler needs and cash basis reporting could be sufficient to meet those needs. At the other end, oh, let's put the other end there. At the other end, tier one MPOs have more complex needs. This might be because they hold the funds of service users, maybe like a, you know, credit savings, uh, credit and savings organizations or micro, micro deposit taking institutions. They've got a bigger burden of uh, sort of assurance that's needed to protect um, people that put their funds there. Or you might, for example, and again, I think it's rare, but it might grow. There might be an NPO that has funds or debt traded on a public exchange. I know India is looking to create a stock exchange for nonprofit organizations. So if you're listed, then there might be a different level of assurance and scrutiny that's needed. So tier one, I think is quite small, quite specific, but we might not meet all of their needs in the standard that we're in the guidance that we're developing. And they might need international or national accrual based standards to meet all of their reporting needs. Now tier two MPOs are the ones that we're focusing our efforts on. They need to track assets and liabilities at the simplest level and report on a range of transactions and activities in order to meet the needs of the users of their financial reports. INPAG is really designed for these NPOs and with the needs of their users in mind. So our project's aim really is to solve for the middle in the first instance. If we can get this tier two guidance right, it should be easier in years to come to create solutions for the other tiers at either side if needed. That said, uh, the guidance should be relevant for and useful for all MPOs. And it's important to remember that it's up to regulators in each country and or a donor to decide which specific NPOs should be allowed to or required to use it. So we're drafting with this middle group in, the, in our minds, but we don't have the authority to say which NPOs should be or must um, adopt it. That's really for regulators at national level. So uh, there we go. That's the end of our little presentation. Let me hand back over to, to Temi. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you for this um, presentation. Um, having heard um, that introduction about the project, now is a chance to some other people here to share your thoughts and your reactions in smaller group. Um, I'm, going, I'm going to invite Samantha back, but before then, I think some people are in the waiting room so that they can be part of this, so that we can let them in. And then um, once Samantha is done, we will see if um, Olufemi's network is still okay, so that I can welcome us back from the smaller group. Um, so at this point, we're going to invite Samantha 
to lead us um, in this process in having smaller groups so that we can share our reactions and thoughts together. Thank you. Sorry, I hadn't seen all the people in the waiting room. Um, okay. But um, Tamitape, I've made you a co-host. So you can also admit them. If you see people there, you can also uh, feel free to admit them as we go along. Brilliant. Okay. Even Akintoye is just rejoining, I think, his uh, network. So, yes, yeah, so what we're going to do now, if you've just joined us, welcome. We've just had an initial presentation with the background to the IFR for MPO project, and we're about to break into some small groups. People are still joining. Um, so what's going to happen? is that we'll be using breakout rooms, which is a Zoom feature. Now, once those rooms are launched, you'll be taken into a new, a new meeting room automatically with eight to 10 people for 12 minutes. Now, it will work best if you're able to have your video on and your microphones are on for the small group chats. If you have any questions or problems, you can use uh, the ask host a question function and I can come into your small meeting and, and help you. Now, what are you going to talk about? So first, you know, briefly introduce yourselves um, and then share any questions or comments that have come to your mind from the introductory presentation that you have just seen. If you've just joined, there might not be any, but you can hear, <coughs> hear the comments and questions uh, from others. Is there anything that you'd like to get clarification about? So just share your reactions and comments and questions. After that, you could discuss the benefits. How can you imagine and how might NPOs, regulators, auditors, donors in Nigeria benefit from this guidance being in place? See if you can imagine a world where this is a new reality, what would it look like? How, what benefits would you see? But also, what challenges can you see in getting there? You can imagine this bright new world, but what are some of the hurdles that you can see uh, that we've got to cross uh, before we get there? And how might we overcome them? Especially from a Nigeria perspective, but also just globally. Now, when the time is up, you'll automatically be brought back into the main meeting. Um, and a spokesperson from your group, you don't have, you can formally pick one or just somebody from your group can speak on your behalf and have a chance to share some of those key ideas that were discussed in your group. So before I create these breakout rooms, does anyone have any questions? Or thoughts? You can unmute yourself or you can um, respond in the chat. No questions. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to um, going to open the groups. Then just go and say hi and discuss questions or comments that have come to mind, benefits and challenges for twelve minutes, and we'll see you back here after that. Oh, that didn't work. Lots of people are unassigned. Okay, I'm going to close all rooms. Let's try this again. Ah, oh, sorry. Breakout rooms. Only one room was made. Sorry, my mistake. I had I tried to do it before everybody was in the meeting, and there's just one group that's going to close shortly. And we'll try that again. What? Uh, Thirty-two seconds. You could get a pen and paper and jot down some of your ideas as we wait for this, these people to come back to us when we create the groups. More people are still joining as well. Okay, I'm going to try that again. Sorry, group one, um, you got sent out, but nobody else did. I'm going to try that again and recreate the groups and that's better. Now I'm going to open it. So take two, off you go to your groups. Recording. 
Great, welcome back everybody from, uh, from those small groups. I know some of you uh, have joined <laughs> mid-group, which might have been a little confusing, but hopefully you can pick up together. Um, I hope there were some fruitful discussions in your groups. Now, we've got about 15 minutes to hear a range of comments and issues coming from people. And there probably won't be time to hear everything from everybody, but we would really love to capture some of the key themes and if what you was on your mind doesn't get spoken, please add it to the chat. This is really important for us to hear from you and understand your, your perspectives. So uh, what we're gonna start yeah. off with is looking at, oh yes, tell me to pay. No, I, I have um, some interesting questions, uh, reactions from my group. Um, uh, okay. So see, do you send maybe, yeah, at that point, so. Thank you, Sam. I'm going to start just with um, questions and comments rather than benefits and challenges, if that's okay. Fire away. Okay. So we had uh, uh, we are just two, two, two short questions. The first one is about, you know, how easily or not are these um, standards going to be adopted, you know, uh, by most of the countries. And uh, it looks, it appears that it's, might be difficult because if we look at the past experience on other international uh, standards, uh, it's always difficult to have everybody involved because many, many countries are still on cash basis accounting and I don't know how we're going to move them from that. And there are many challenges linked to that. So how is, uh, you know, uh, how on your side do you think you can you can shift this type of challenge and how are you going to do it? So that's maybe interesting to know. That's the first thing. Great question. The second one is, uh, yes, yes. The first one is I'm talking from my perspective as, as auditor. So been dealing with a lot of reporting staff and it's always difficult, you know, because we are, as auditors, we are bound by some standards as well. So how, yeah. Are you linking this IFR for NPO with uh, stuff like um, you know the, the US GAAP or the IPSAS, and you know how would this help the auditors? You know when we are auditing stuff. So I just want to know your perspective on that, just to be short. Those are fantastic questions. Should we take another couple of comments and questions and then we can respond to them? That's brilliant, thank you. Who else would like to raise their hand? If you want to raise your hand, go to the reactions button at the bottom and click raise hand and then we can bring you in. Who else? Anybody else? Okay, well, I'll answer those as other people think of other questions and comments that have come to mind. So. Um, these are what you've mentioned are really challenges, aren't they? It's very true. How easily will they be adopted? And you talked about how it's taken a long time for countries to adopt the other standards. So if we look at IFRS, for example, they started in the 1970s as international accounting standards. And now we have 193 countries have adopted them. So it's taken 50 years, but we have got quite a lot of different countries using IFRS. And even if they're not using IFRS off the shelf, they refer to it, they generally want to align to it. So we have had this, oh, let's just mute. If you're not uh, presenting, if you could mute, that would be great. So what we do have is a move towards, oh, somebody is talking. If you can see that you're, uh, I might just mute everybody. Hopefully that will have got rid of the background noise. Sorry about that. I just muted everybody so that um, we can hear. Um, if you have a question, please do raise your hand and we'd love to hear from you. Um, so it's taken 50 years for IFRS, but we've now got quite wide adoption or at least convergence. Uh, for IPSAS, they started in the 1997. We've got uh, 73 countries have adopted or are in the process of adopting IPSAS, that's governments. So again, there's a, there is a general move towards uh, adopting international standards, but that's taken 25 years to get to 73 countries. 
I think uh, it's certainly not going to be overnight and it's not going to be easy, but um, we've got the transcription going. Okay, that's fine. Um, so we have got, to, we've been working with a number of countries to facilitate uh, adoption at national level. Um, and we do hope that we will see over, over a number of years. Our target is 10 countries by 2030. And let's hope that we get a domino or snowball effect after that. But this is a long-term uh, project for sure. You talked about cash basis accounting. And it's true that this, for many organizations, there could be a transition from cash to accrual. The goal is to keep it as simple accrual basis as needed. So trying to steer clear of some of the more subjective and excessively complicated aspects of accrual accounting, which might not really add value uh, to users in our sector. Um, but that a really a proper understanding of assets and liabilities is actually necessary to be able to govern, manage and, and assess uh, an entity. Then we have, of course, the conflict between donor, donors possibly wanting cash basis reporting and uh, your general purpose reporting on an accrual basis. That has been a topic of conversation with the donor reference group. And there's quite a lot of material on the website. And we issued a report about that recently as well. Uh, so I can share that with you. I wouldn't say we've solved that issue, but there's certainly a lot of ways that we can help mitigate it. Um, so very important to have mentioned it. And it's been a, a lot of subject of conversation in the advisory groups. So I hope that answers those questions, uh, at least partially. The second one about auditors and auditing standards. So if the auditor is already familiar with US GAAP or IPSAS or IFRS, so the plan is to base the guidance on IFRS for SME as a starting point. It's got 24 sections, 250 pages. The concepts are based on IFRS, which is broadly familiar. And then we will take out sections that aren't relevant, like earnings per share, add in new sections that are needed and make amendments to existing sections. So that way it should have a level of familiarity appropriate to IFRS for SME, and yet it will be um, relevant to the needs of the sector. Uh, again, there's, uh, that was a whole chapter in the consultation paper. Uh, what were the criteria for picking a, a, a standard as a starting point, a national standard or an international standard and which standard and why? Uh, again, so I, I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll Point, I'll put something in the chat later that can point you to those resources. Great questions that we've also discussed quite uh, deeply. But we hope that basing on IFRS for, IFRS for SME will give auditors a framework that is not entirely foreign and something that they can quote in their opinions. That's the idea. So I hope that helps. I'd love to hear who else has got a question or a comment, something that came to mind while they were discussing. I think your hand is raised. Oh, I can't see a raised. Oh, yes, now I see the hands. Ah, Francis. <laughs> yes, Francis, come in. You're welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Okay, so in our breakout session, we considered uh, basically two things. Also looking from the perspective of Nigeria specifically, that this will be a very good um, project. It's a very good project that will help a lot. First, to bring uniformity. It's something which is basically lacking in the uh, NGO world in Nigeria. And then secondly, um, two things which we pointed out as a kind of question. Are you currently engaging the regulatory authorities in Nigeria? At the moment, it seems there's nothing currently in existence. Now, I am happy that ICANN um, is present in this meeting, but what kind of engagement are you having with them so that it will be easy for them to adopt it? Now, we raised the concern about experts in the field here in Nigeria. There are very few competent people in the NGO accounting session. So is there any plan to also have a kind of training to prepare them such that when this is a, 
this guideline is out, it's easy to transition because one thing is that it's going to bring a kind of disruption. Thank you. Amy, do you want to speak to engagement with the regulators? Yeah. Um, currently, um, we we are trying to we are, we have a that's why we have a group now. Um, we call it the the country working group. Um, here we want we still want people to come on board. Um, we want people that are interested. We want the stakeholders. We want people from the regulatory bodies to be part. So before by the before we conclude this meeting, we are going to leave it open. And also, we'll, we've been trying to get in touch with the regulatory bodies, and um, and we are leaving it open here. So by the time we finish, if you're interested, and if you have any contact, you can just you know shoot us a mail. Uh, you, you are welcome to do that, um, Francis. So actually, after this meeting, I'll follow up with you. If you also have um, um, network in the reg the like regulatory. Uh, bodies and if you also want to be part of the um, working group so this working group will be will be um, people that can actually influence and you know go into the the um, the regulatory bodies and um, and make them part of this um, project so that it will be easy to adopt by the time it's fully fully um, done so it's open okay. after you get to know more by the time we're ending so that um, Okay. Amil's saying he can't hear a thing. Is that a common problem that everybody can't hear, or is that a, a specific problem? Let, let us know in the chat. Hear. Okay, most people can hear. Okay. Um, so, and in, in more generally, so that's the regulator answer for Nigeria specifically. I believe the Financial Reporting Council are being invited to be part of the working group. Um, we are having country champions like uh, Tomito Pay in. Uh, 33 countries and part of their remit is to engage with their regulators so it's strategically absolutely uh, such an important group because they hold the strings of being able to put forward legislation that would uh, recommend adoption in a given country so we've definitely got them as a key stakeholder group in Nigeria please work with your country champions do the advocacy, the networking that you need to bring your regulator on board. They absolutely are essential to be part of this conversation. The second question was about um, experts and training. You're absolutely right. Like with any, any project like this, there will be a hump, there will be a, a hill to climb when it comes to transition and training and adoption. And the long-term belief is that the long-term benefits will be worth the short-term pain. There is budget in the project development to develop on free online training resources um, in four languages. And after that, I'm sure there will be a small industry in providing training. So the same training providers that train for the for-profit sector and the public sector will now have a standard that they can develop training uh, resources for in the, going forward in the long term. And, and the training bodies within each country can cater to that. But there's something to train to. At the moment, there's no standard to train people in. And so we end up with people being very specialized in EU reporting or very specialized in USAID, um, but it becomes difficult for that skill to get cross-transferred. Um, so yes, training crucial, and we are looking to provide training in 2025 ahead of the launch. Great, are there any other hands up? Let's see. Yes, we have. Um, so, can we take some few more questions, or you respond to the uh, the questions after the meeting? Yeah, I think what I'd like to do in the interest of time, because we have got another section of this meeting, and we want to end on time at half past. And we're fast approaching that. So, I think what we'll do, if you've got other questions or comments, challenges or benefits that you've thought of, please, please, please mention them in the chat. Um, we'd really love to know them. And for, for now, I think we'll progress to the next part of the um, session, if that's okay. So yeah. I'm going to um, get the slide deck up again. Bear with me for a moment. Yeah, so I do, at this point, I don't know, um, Akitoye, are you available to take um, the next session or I go ahead? 
Yes, uh, I'm available. I'm, I'm praying and hoping that the network doesn't fluctuate, fluctuate this time. Yeah, those are one of the challenges we have in Nigeria, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's wait for Samantha to bring up the slide. This so that slide, you can yeah. Continue okay. there. yeah. Thank you. Struggling to find my menu. The Zoom menu has disappeared. Sorry. Ah, here we are. There we go. So I think you can see that. Brilliant. Yes. Okay. Okay. So so um, thank you so much, Samantha, uh, for your wonderful presentation, and thank you, Timmy Topper, for being a wonderful host. Uh, so let's let's move into strategy for Nigeria. We've um, hopefully that discussion that has been made has arose our interest to participate more. Uh, as well as this public consultation as they are conducted during the development process. So permit me to not to switch on my video uh, because of, it won't fluctuate this time if, since the video is off. But I believe you can all hear me now. Yes, bit, bit in and out, but let's keep going. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, okay, so. The analysis of the consultation paper responses was presented on the 2nd of February um, this year, um, and the, the summary of uh, on the website, so you can visit the website to see the summary of the responses on the consultation paper. So the analysis from the consultation paper responses will form the basis for developing a draft guidance itself. Okay, so this will be done in three tranches um, of work, each culminating in the release of an exposure draft. Um, so we are working towards bringing out an exposure draft. Um, after the exposure draft, there will be a four-month consultation period, uh, which will, uh, during which there will be a webinar and regional consultation meetings. Individuals and organizations will be invited to submit their responses to each of these transfers in writing via the website. So the feedback from the exposure draft will then inform the changes to be made in the final impact guidance. Which we hope to launch in 2015. Okay, next slide. 2025. 2025. Yeah, 2025, <laughs> yes, in 2025, thank you. Uh, so um, these are the stakeholder group. Uh, so looking at the situation in Nigeria, we have uh, some key stakeholders uh, who are influential stakeholders. Um, who are these influential stakeholders? We have the MPOs themselves, uh, who, are the, who prepare financial statements, but often their reporting requirements are dictated by external parties like the donors, uh, we have the regulators and, and the auditors. So for this reason, uh, we have developed a multi-stakeholder country-level working group. Um, I think this is also going to address some of the questions that, that were asked during um, the, the breakout session. So currently, we have a working country-level working, level working group, uh, and this comprises of donor representative, professional accountancy um, organizations, that is ICANN and ANAN members. We have sectors. Um, regulators that include the tax authorities, accountant general office. Uh, we also have large sub-granting international NGOs. We have small and medium-sized national MPOs. Uh, we have the big four audit firms. We have the small stroke medium audit so stroke consultancy firm. And we have the academicians as well. So um, including the, the country champions. So the aim is to support the development of the non-profit financial reporting from the Nigeria point of view. So the essence of having this group forming and coming together is so that we can respond to the exposure draft, looking at the eye, uh, using the Nigerian eye to look at it. So we hope to contribute to this discussion uh, with a national lens and provide appropriate inputs 
and recommendation for the final guidance. Uh, so the country working group will also be well placed to respond and give advice to Nigerian stakeholders on issues and inquiry, inquiries relating to the project. Uh, so after the guidance is issued in 2025, uh, the country working group would discuss whether and how to adopt it, including consideration, scope, and the provision for training of accountants, auditors, and regulators. So that, that's why we're having um, members from all the key stakeholders coming together to form the country working group uh, so that at the time of adoption, um, this group will also be stand as an advocacy group uh, to the governments uh, for um, the guidance to be adopted. Uh, we have some gaps for currently, uh, we are not completing the group. So if you are interested, you can kindly reach out to me. Uh, I've typed my email in the chat, in chat section uh, for you to, to look at. So if, if you're interested, kindly just reach out to me either through email or through um, my LinkedIn profile, okay? Uh, so what can we do uh, as Nigerians? So in order to have a voice, we need to be aware of the pro proposals being made and the questions um, that are coming up are like, who, uh, who should uh, be interested? We have individuals, organizations, organization champions, um, then the country working group all coming together um, as a country to respond uh, to, to the exposure draft and be part of, of the project. Uh, so we should, in order to be aware and to be part of it, we should be visiting um, the project website. Uh, okay, visit, we should visit the project website. Uh, then we can subscribe to um, in project emails. Then also we, we can connect to the project account. Yeah, I think we've lost Akintoya again. Oh, yeah. LinkedIn and uh, to the project director's account, to my account in LinkedIn. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so thank you so much. Okay, so to share our opinions, some people we, we've been invited um, to regional consultation events and focus group discussion, and all of us are free to submit written re responses to the questions in uh, the exposure draft. Uh, so who should be involved? Like I rightly said, uh, we have individuals, any of you are welcome, um, individuals from many relevant stakeholders as well as consultants and trainers. Uh, the project is particularly keen to receive responses from organization. Uh, if you're interested in coordinating a response from organization, you can register as an organization champion and the project will be able to provide some guidance for you in that role. Uh, so the country working group is also expected to discuss and debate the question from a Nigeria-wide perspective. And when we are doing that, we will also seek um, your inputs uh, during that time for your own contribution as well. So okay, I think. Okay, I think we doesn't get written. Okay. I think Tammy, do you want to just take it from here? Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Akito. The network was really, really erratic, but we heard uh, most of um, what you said. Um, let's go. Um, let's go to the next slide. Can we talk about the end goal? The goal of, of um, the Nigeria strategy? Yeah. Well, let me do this. Yeah, I'll finish this yeah, slide and then you can do the next one. Yeah, the slide is really very... It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so the first, the, in terms of why, why is it worth having a Nigeria level strategy? So first, it's really important that this international guidance doesn't get written without the expertise of Nigerian professionals. We need you to be part of it without the perspective and input from Nigeria. Secondly, 
So it's making good guidance internationally. We need your input. Secondly, it's hoped that Nigeria will be a country that can adopt the guidance in time. So again, this working group and this Nigeria strategy is about preparing the ground for that if it happens. So back over to you, Temi. Your network is off to. Okay, maybe I should take it from here. Let me take it from here. Um, we mentioned that one of the ways to learn about the project proposal is through the project website. So there are a couple of sessions we do like to highlight for you. There are sections called, uh, called the accounting issues, which has a page, it has a video, a link, and resources on each of the landscape level and specific accounting issues that have been addressed uh, by the project. So whenever the project has public consultations, all of the responses are available. So you can see who responded and what they said. It's all fully transparent, it's a fully transparent um, process. And the final session to draw your attention to um, is the event page. All the project events are free. It's easy to register from the website. So I encourage everyone um, to register. There are also pages with um, blogs uh, and other resources. I really encourage us to take a look um, at it. So um, the single most important message we would like you to take away from this whole meeting is this. You know, we have an opportunity for a generation to shape the future. So we want everyone to be part of it. We encourage um, people to be part of it. So please encourage um, um, to share. We encourage you to share your voice during the consultation process so that you can be among the generation that will shape uh, the future. Uh, so we have here some um, useful slides for you, which you can assess from um, the PDF that is being shared in the chat now. Actually, I'll share it in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Samantha, let, let me know when you are done with that. No, keep moving on. I'll share it during the final questions section because we've only got okay. one, one minute till the, the end of the meeting. Oh, so we have a few minutes. Uh, if you, I don't know if you have a few minutes for questions and comments at this point. Um, I don't, if not, um, Samantha, we can't take any questions at this point, right? I think it's there a bit a late, hand. but there if you there is a hand. If you put if you could put your question in the chat, I will manage it even as we do our final uh, final closing comments, if that's okay. Okay. So thank you very much for participating and thank you, Akitoye, for this and Samantha for this great presentation. Um I have a very exciting announcement to make. Um, I'm delighted. Um that um, Akitoye is going to be taking over from me as a Nigerian country champion. Um, so you, if you have any questions or um, uh, comments or anything you want to know about, you can always reach out to him and Samantha, or you can copy me, but um, he's going to be taking over as the country champion going forward. Congratulations, Akitoye. So at this point, I will invite um, Samantha back if there's anything to say at this point so that she can round off uh, the meeting. Thank you so much. Samantha, over to you. Okay, thank you so, so much. I just, I have shared the link to uh, the um, PowerPoint presentation, a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation. The, re the recording and the slides will also be shared, given to you in email and will be shared on the website in due course as well. So I really just want to thank all of you for your engagement, for your brilliant comments and discussions. I'm looking forward to diving into the chat. And I especially want to thank uh, Timitope and um, Olfemi, who've been fabulous country champions in Nigeria and really look forward to working with you in the months and years to come. This is a long-term project, but really hope that it will be worth it for all of us. Yeah. So thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you everyone, bye. Bye.